So we're talking about very old documents that predate the Bible by many, many, many thousands of years. These stone tablets have lasted for thousands and thousands of years. They knew exactly what they were doing. They were leaving a record behind that we would find in the future, almost like a time capsule. When you go into the ancient tablets, you discover a lot of things that will wow you and maybe even frighten you a little bit. We're the new kids on the block. We just arrived here. There's people out there, and the human race is prevalent in this universe. Prevalent. In this galaxy, at least. Evidence of it is all around us. We don't have one sun in our solar system. We have two. NASA announced that they discovered Planet Nine. They discovered not only one planet, but multiple, orbiting in very elliptical orbits and very strange orbits inside of our solar system. Now, we're going to go with the Enuma Elish, the seven tablets of creation. Now, the Enuma Elish is actual real tablets that were discovered in Iraq. These tablets are real. They're not fabrications. They're real tablets that actually exist. Now, most of the Tablet 5 has never been recovered until recently, which we're going to go over because it's really amazing that they just found Tablet number 5 uh, not too long ago. It's actually in a museum in Iraq right now. Uh, so we had a big portion of that tablet missing, but now because of that, the story is even much more clear. The epic is one of the most, the Babylonian worldview, centered on the supremacy of Marduk, and we're going to talk about Marduk a little bit today. That's also known as Amun-Ra. And one thing you understand, when you hear me say the word God, I'm not talking about the creator of the universe, okay? When we're talking about the ancient Sumerians, we're always talking about people. I consider them people. Some people say that they think that they're wraiths or ghosts or multidimensional beings and so forth. You can believe whatever you want. Based on my research and the physical evidence of bones being discovered and skulls discovered that are in museums around the world and myself going to Cairo Museum and seeing what's there, in my personal opinion, these were flesh and blood people that were just much more advanced and displayed high levels of technology. And because of that, we call them gods. We revere things that we believe are magical or that we can't understand. It happens all the time. It's called a cargo cult. I think that human beings are the biggest cargo cult probably in the solar system. We saw these beings come here and they displayed magic science, which is advanced technology, and it wowed us. And uh, we've been praising them ever since. Amun-Ra, for example, Marduk, a lot of people don't know that he was the one who ushered in monotheism. Monotheism is the belief in a one world God and not to worship any other gods. Matter of fact, in the Sumerian tablets, it says, you're not to worship any other god but me, which is the same thing it says in the Bible. Amun-Ra is the one who ordered everybody to say amen or Amun-Ra at the end of every prayer, which then became shortened to amen. So at the end of every prayer, whoever says amen is actually giving thanks and homage to one of the most brutal rulers of all time. And that's what happens when you don't research or you don't know. It's a part of the process. You have to, somebody has to tell it to you. Now that I've told you, you should go look it up because it's very valid and very true. When you go into the ancient tablets, you discover a lot of things that will wow you <laughs> and maybe even frighten you a little bit. The Enuma Elish exists in various copies from Babylonia and Assyria. The version from the library of Ashurbanipal dates back to the 7th century BCE. The composition of the text probably dates to the Bronze Age, to the time of Hammurabi, and perhaps earlier to the Kassite era, roughly 18th century to 16th century BCE. So we're talking about very old documents that predate the Bible by many, many, many thousands of years. This is tablet number five, which was recently found in Tulumaniya Museum in Iraq, tablet five. This was just last year. Somebody stumbled across it at the actual museum. It was never even labeled. Nobody knew exactly what it was until a, a scholar said, hey, babe, I think this looks familiar. <laughs> Could this be the missing tablet to the Enuma Elish? So now it's been well documented and it's, it's found. So we have a more complete story. So I want to talk a little bit about the translations of these tablets. And I want to really, again, add more credibility to this. Now, there's a researcher out there that a lot of people know by the name of Zachariah Sitchin. He didn't translate these tablets. And the reason why I say that, I respect Zachariah Sitchin's work. I believe that he's one of the greatest researchers in our modern day. I respect the effort that the guy put in. I love everything that he's, that he's done. I've read every single book that he's ever put out. And I've looked at every video he's ever been in. And I think that his work is just like all the other works of a lot of the other researchers. It leaves a little room for your own perceptions. Now, what I found through reading probably six or seven different books about the Anunnaki and now translating the text myself, I come to find out that the underlying story, no matter who translates it, is always the same. People came here. They mined this earth's resources. At some point, they decided to genetically participate in, in creating or manipulating an existing hominid on this planet. So no matter what 
what source you get it from, it's all the same story with different nuances. Some people think Nibiru, some people think Sirius, some th people think Pleiades, some people think Orion. These tablets were credibly translated by scholars a long time ago. Uh, you can go online to the British Museum website and you can actually pull up the library of Ashurbanipal and then you can view the tablets here yourself. People say if they were so advanced, well, why were they writing in clay tablets? Well, I've been through four computers in the last four years, almost a computer a year, a laptop a year. They're made by man. They destroy very easily. I mean, if you leave them out in the rain and weather, forget about it. It's over. If I drop it in a tub of water, it's done. These stone tablets have lasted for thousands and thousands of years. They knew exactly what they were doing. They were leaving a record behind that we would find in the future almost like a time capsule of information, which is why the, the Sumerians and the Anunnaki put a lot of stuff into stone. They built through stone megalithic structures. They built information. They computed sacred geometry, mathematics, uh, cosmology, everything into stone. And one of the things they've done well with stone is they've actually been able to write on it and bake it and put it in a way where now, in this day and age, we're able to actually get it out, decipher it, and find out what happened back then. If it was done on paper and stuff like that, it's very highly unlikely. And another thing that I like about stone is very hard to change the information around. Kind of like some of the more modern religious books have been altered in so many ways. Just with the modern Bible, over 8,000 incorrect translations just in that one book. Now multiply that over many, many books and many different publishers, and you start to find out a lot of information is backwards. Just to give you a small example, uh, Moses did not cross the Red Sea. He crossed the Sea of Reeds. So he didn't cross the Red Sea, he crossed the Sea of Reeds, which is another smaller sea, much closer and much easier to cross. But when you go to the original translations, you, you find this out, you know, so, but these are some of the, that's just a small one that, um, and this is still being taught today that Moses crossed the Red Sea, but he actually didn't cross the Red Sea according to the actual original text. Another good point here is that one last piece of credibility. Anybody here now can decipher these tablets for themselves. You don't have to be an expert translator, a linguist, an expert in cuneiform. You can go to the UCLA CDLI library online for free, grab a stone tablet off the virtual shelf, drop it into a translator, and read the tablet. Anybody can spend their time and go through these translations. And what you're going to discover, the underlying story, the fundamental basis of the story is very, very similar no matter who writes writes a book about it. Now the Torah has been known as the law of God, which is actually what it translates to. A lot of the text in the Torah comes from Assyrian and Sumerian. A lot of the information in this scripture originates from thousands and thousands of years prior. So a lot of people say, well, you know, you're saying names like Marduk when I'm talking online and making posts and stuff, and you're talking about Enki and Enlil and all these Anunnaki people, but where is their name? Where does their name exist anywhere else? It's in the Torah. <laughs> The Torah knows all about Enki and Lil, Marduk, all these people, all these characters. They're all in, the, in these uh, texts. But some of the texts are amazingly copied virtually almost word for word from the Sumerian tablets. Here's the um, ancient Jewish history website, jewishvirtuallibrary.org. And in here, I just did use the simple highlight tool to search for the word Marduk. But it's basically one of the lines that's saying that Marduk was the son of uh, Enki and that his rise to power ahead of time, because they always went, rose to power based on celestial movements. Marduk battled to rise to power ahead of time uh, and became the one that rules in Pisces, which is where the Christian religion rose and monotheism rose because he's the one who ushered in monotheism. He's the one who became the sun god and ordered Akhenaten to usher in monotheism. Another thing that a lot of people don't know, they've gotten it wrong is a lot of the noses that have been knocked off of all the statues and, and so forth. It's not because white people didn't want black people to know that they were black. I, I just got to tell you like it is. It's because Akhenaten ordered it to be done. When I went to Egypt, not only did he order that, he ordered thousands upon thousands of glyphs, hieroglyphs of the ancient gods, Osiris and everybody else, to be defaced and removed. And a lot of them were even deleted. Story, many stories even deleted, which is why he was, they proclaimed heresy against him and, and basically ran him out of there. But that's the truth behind monotheism and the truth behind a lot of these. No, I'm not saying all of them, but I'm telling you, based off of my personal experience, getting on a plane, getting my passport stamped and going to Egypt and sitting with homegrown Egyptologists and homegrown guides uh, and finding out these stories and then researching these tablets for myself and researching these books, I found out that that's what happened. And there's so many areas when you go to Egypt that these temples are completely defaced. Almost every single hieroglyph has been scraped off. You can just see the outlines of the hieroglyph. And I'm talking about tens of thousands of glyphs. And these were done long before Napoleon and all these other people even were born. It's a fact. Now we're going to get into some cosmology because the New Militia is a very interesting story. It really is a combination of two stories. One part is talking about the creation of the solar system, which sounds like a battle between people, but it's really a battle between planets. The Sumerians wrote this story based on their belief that the planets were sentient beings 
and even gave them names. Now, over millennia, as the story was retold and retold, the names changed a little bit to the victor being the god ruling at that time. And in this particular case, Marduk was Nibiru, the planet that crashed into Tiamat. They've now cataloged two trillion galaxies, and that's just a small view of the sky. And each galaxy has about 200 million suns and over 100 million planets. Now, do the math just on that small spot of the sky that we've cataloged so far. The fact that we are not alone is not even a question. We're the new kids on the block. We just arrived here. There's people out there, and the human race is prevalent in this universe. Prevalent. In this galaxy, at least. Evidence of it is all around us. There may be slightly different versions of us and how we look, the color of our skin, and everything else, but the evidence is all around us. Right now, we know that we're in the Milky Way galaxy, and that little tiny dot with that circle is our sun and our solar system. Out of all of those trillions and trillions of solar systems out there and galaxies and everything else, that's us, this little dot right here. Scientists now know that we are not from here. We meaning our entire solar system. We are the aliens. Imagine the shock of growing up in a loving family with people you call mom and dad and then suddenly learning that you are actually adopted. This same sense of shock came as scientists announced that the sun, the moon, our planet and its siblings were not born into the familiar band of stars known as the Milky Way galaxy, but we actually belong to a strange formation with an unfamiliar name of the Sagittarius Dwarf Galaxy. We are from another galaxy. Spa Earth is really a spaceship. We have, not in the sense of a metal, metallic object, but an actual biological you know, object, we've traveled as two galaxies have merged. We are from the Sagittarius Dwarf Galaxy, and this type of thing happens all the time, believe it or not. Galaxies collide and form bigger and bigger galaxies. A lot of people don't know that. Some of the ga Our galaxy is relatively small compared to some of the galaxies out there. This is an amazing discovery. I didn't know about this myself until about four years ago, but this is a very important piece of information to understand that we ourselves aren't from here because you start to understand what happens when planets become rogue and they go out there and they float through space like we're talking about Planet X, the Bureau, and all these other planets. And people go, oh, it can't be, it's impossible. Well, we ourselves are a result of a collision. Now, just like atoms are mostly empty space, believe it or not, galaxies are mostly empty space. The distances are so far and vast that they typically pass through one another or coalesce together with very you know, few collisions happening, but collisions do happen. We're going to move away a little bit from cosmology into actual beings. Rogue planets like that, like Nibiru or Planet X or brown dwarf stars, how real are they? And how many are there out there? This is another big question. It's like, oh man, you know, it sounds pretty good and everything, but I just don't believe there's planets out there floating around in space. And how can a planet float, go that far away from the sun and come back? And, and how could there be people living on it and everything else? So you see, mainstream science already knows this happened in ancient times. It's not a mystery to them. Rogue planets, there's billions of them out there. This is from Scientific American. Wandering in the void, billions of planets without a home. There's billions of planets out there that are just free floating in space. Now this is an image from NASA depicting a brown dwarf star that they believe is orbiting our sun, which means that we live in a binary solar system. We don't have one sun in our solar system, we have two. But this is a very interesting graphic that they've shown because it depicts the same ancient information about uh, an, a rogue planet orbiting our sun every 3,600 years in a very elliptical orbit, which came from the Enuma Elish. NASA announced that they discovered Planet 9. They discovered not only one planet, but multiple, orbiting in very elliptical orbits and very strange orbits inside of our solar system. The one particular that's about four to six times the size of the Earth, they, la they labeled it Planet 9 because the Sumerians labeled it the 10th planet, but they wouldn't do that. But uh, they labeled it Planet 9. This is the Dogon tribe. Some of you may have heard of them. Some of you may have not heard of them. The Dogon tribe have a very interesting story in that they originate from Egypt, which was actually Kem in ancient times, before it was called Egypt. The Dogons started there. Uh, for whatever reason, their tribe left out of Egypt and moved into Mali, Africa. But they took the secret wisdom and sacred wisdom of this information that I'm gonna show you now, along with them, and have passed it down for thousands and thousands of generations. And here we are now today with the Dogon tribe describing celestial information that we only discovered more recently in the 1970s. They believe that the Nomo Anunnaki came from a star system named Sirius. Uh, not only just Sirius, but a dark star out there called, we call it Sirius B, which is actually a failed star or a star that ran out of fuel. It's a very small uh, dim light in the sky that can't be seen with the naked eye. 
and it wasn't even detected by astronomers until recently, which you'll see in a second. They also depict these creatures or these Anunnaki beings as being fish like people or having fish suits on. And you see how they dress up in this garb and attire when they do their rituals to honor the Anunnaki, these nomos. There's also in the top center, there's a Sumerian seal. That Sumerian seal depicts Enki and Enlil wearing fish suits. And there's a reason for that, which we're going to go over in a couple of minutes. They know what's out there. And this information is still not in any history book or school book or anything. Trappist star system is a brown dwarf that was discovered by the Hubble. And it has planets orbiting it. And they're in a habitable zone. And the reason why I want to show this image is because it proves that a brown dwarf star can have a habitable zone. It can have planets orbiting it that can sustain life. Based off of what I read between the Sumerian tablets, the Mahabharata, the Bhagavad Gita, Indian Vedas, and a lot of other ancient texts that I can go through, I discover that these Anunnaki beings weren't just one race of people. Some authors believe that they were all one color. Some people believe they were all white. Some people believe they were all black. Some people believe they were all Indian. Some people believe they were all or, or indigenous. Some people believe they were all blue skinned. When you go to Egypt and you see these people depicted as green beings and you uh, and blue beings and and you read the accounts of these beings and some of their spouses were even from other planets. These people were multi-racial people. And the evidence of that is the fact that when you look around this room right now, we're not all one color. We're not all one. We're, we're all a human race, but we're not all the same color or the same specific sub race. Because as they spread around the planet, they put their own genetic markers on indigenous hominids, which is the evidence of that is in the uh, Emerald Tablets. I want to go into the Sumerian Kings list right before we end. This is very important. This is one of the most important things. It's only like uh, less than a minute. The importance of this is the fact that 450,000 years ago, the Anunnaki decided to come to this planet to mine for resources that they needed. And why would they do that? Well, we're doing the same thing. We now have a mission to go to an asteroid to mine it for resources. So why wouldn't a, a species more advanced than us do the same thing? For whatever reason that they needed them, we don't specifically know. Okay, some say it was gold, some say, but we have evidence that they mined all different types of resources, not just gold. The gold mines have been discovered in Africa dating back a couple hundred thousand years, which ironically is around the same exact time that Homo sapiens appeared on this planet and the evidence has now been discovered. Uh, but the Sumerian Kings list is before the flood. So what happened was before the flood, according to the Enuma Elish, the Anunnaki ruled this planet themselves. They worked themselves. They did all the mining themselves. They didn't have human beings here to work for them as slaves. They were doing the work, and they had these, this group of working class Anunnaki called Ejiji. That's exactly specifically the name given in the Numelish and the Epic of Atreasis. Well, they got tired of all this work. They were working, 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 but they weren't supposed to be slaves. But if they would let up on the work, they would be punished. So what does that tell you? <laughs> slaves. Uh, so these, these, these people enslaved their own people uh, and forced them, this working class, to do all this work. A lot of the work was done on Mars, and a lot of the work was done here on Earth, but Mars was very brutal for the, for the EGG, and they were complaining that uh, because of the thin atmosphere and because of lack of water and resources, uh, and Mars was actually like a way station for them to relaunch back to their own planet with these resources, uh, and no women, they were going to have a revolt. So they decided to revolt against Enki and Enlil. They came back to Earth in, in ships. I don't think they were boat ships on oceans. I think they were starships. They came here. They encircled Enki's property and Enlil's property and threatened to go all out war on a revolt. Now, if you're not being enslaved, why would you need to revolt against something? They were obviously being forced to do this labor for many shars and the shars 3,600 years and they did it for hundreds of shars. So at that point, when Anu, who was Enki and Enlil's father, saw what was going on, he decided to find a way to come up with a solution because it didn't make any sense. It was gonna slow down production and everything else. Enki says, well, there's an existing hominid on this planet that we can genetically modify, bringing them up by adding our essence to them and making them do the labor, bear the labor of the EGG. And this is exactly what they decided to do. Now, they had a couple of experiments in the beginning where they created these cloning chambers, which have also been discovered, these ancient type of chambers where the, the remnants of them are left behind in Africa and also in Iraq. Dominic Joyce, one of my researchers in Anunnaki history, went to the Ashmolean Museum in Oxford, England for me and took a video, this is from his own phone, of the King's List, the Sumerian King's List, which is a physical thing that really exists. You can go see it for yourself. These kings ruled for that many, 241,000 years, just eight kings. And they ruled over themselves. There weren't any humans at the time until towards the end. And after the flood came, which the flood was pulled on by Enlil, and Lil said, okay, this, it's, I, I want to start fresh again. We, we need to start fresh. These humans now are reproducing too much. They're making too much noise. And I think we should just wipe it out. 
and start fresh. And he, he was very brutal. He would put plagues out. Uh, he would just call humans at will. Very evil person. He's the one actually named uh, in a lot of ancient texts as Satan or Satan. And Lil is Satan. He twisted it on his brother Enki because Enki was, uh, fell in love with humans, uh, was the creator, but put a little bit too much juice in us. Gave us a little bit too much DNA, which science likes to call junk DNA, which is actually just disconnected upper level, high level genetics, but gave us a higher level of conscious, consciousness that he was told to give. He was also the one that was the father, most likely, of Atrahasis, which is Noah, and gave him information on how to avoid the flood, by the, which, by the way, in the Atrahasis epic was only a seven day advance notice. He didn't have years to build an ark, by the way, guys. The Atrahasis says it was only seven days advance notice, and he gathered some local animals and some, some of his contents and so forth and his family, and they got on the boat, and they survived the flood, which, this, which pissed off Enlil even more. So after the flood is when they decided to, uh, came to an agreement to allow human beings, half human, half Anunnaki beings, to be pharaohs and kings over human beings. So after the flood is when kingship was actually handed down to mankind. This is the Atrahasis epic uh, tablet, which is also in the British Museum. And you can go to the British Museum website and see it there. The Emerald Tablet has a very good uh, description of what happened after the Great Flood, which I think is very important to understand. I'm going to go right into just the information. This is from the first tablet. Over the world, then broke the Great Water. So right now, 36,000 years ago, the Emerald Tablet, which was written, is telling us that water broke over the Earth, changing Earth's balance until only the Temple of Light was left. Standing in the Great Mountain on Undal, still rising out of the water, some there too were living, saved from the rush of the fountain. So we have evidence of a flood 36,000 years ago. In my book, The Compendium of the Emerald Tablets, lends credibility to these tablets. Who wrote them? How many famous people have deciphered them? Where Isaac Newton's copy is and everything else. Okay, so these tablets are real objects that exist uh, and were really written about. Now, what's important about this is the fact that it talks about a flood 36,000 years ago. And why I say that's important is because when you look at three processional periods of the Sphinx of Great Egypt, the Great Sphinx, you discover that's about 36,000 years ago or three ice ages ago when that Sphinx was built. Now the evidence is, is, is compounding on the fact that the, war, the weathering of the Sphinx puts it back around three processional periods of Leo, which means that the Sphinx is, is exactly where it's supposed to be 36,000 years ago when these tablets were written by Thoth, who also claims to be the builder of the Great Pyramid in the Emerald Tablets themselves, which were written 36,000 years ago. He himself ruled over Egypt or ancient Kem 14,000 years. So we have an, another ancient account written by Thoth the Atlantean of him and his people. Uh, in this account, in the first tablet, him and his crew get sent out by Enki, who's also called Thought Me, to go to the land of Kem. But they, they, what they do is they say they get into the sky ship and they rise up over the land and they go to the land of Kem over the waters and then they, they descend onto the land. So they're rising up and descending, which means that they're in something that can actually take off and land. It's not a boat that goes on the ocean. At which point they get out. Now, when they get out, these barbarians, these most likely are survivors or humankind has been knocked back into the Stone Age, come to attack them, where Thoth raises his staff and sends out a ray of vibration, stopping them still as a stone in the mountain. The Thoth is actually the son of, um, uh, uh, what are the sons of Enki? and also fell in love with humans and was the one who brought, taught us writing and reading and, and, and a lot of different knowledges. Chem, which is chemistry, which is why they called it Chem, the land of Chem before it was Egypt, and also alchemy. He was an alchemist. But his father tells him to go out and do this and raise these barbarians to a high level of civilization. And then in the first tablet, Thoth tells his crew to spread out all over the planet and bring everybody to a high level of civilization. So here we have an account 36,000 years ago, post-flood of people that are very advanced, whether they're from here or not, going around the planet and spreading uh, knowledge and information and enlightenment and bringing people to a higher level of civilization. And the evidence of that is the fact that we have these tablets, we have Sumerians that know the orbit of uh, planets around our sun. We know that they claim in this particular tablet, VA-243, which is in the museum, that this particular intruder planet exists according to the Sumerians. And now we have found it with our own scientific data. We have the Sumerian account of the solar system showing that there's a nemesis or a, or a brown dwarf or red dwarf star potentially orbiting our sun that has planets orbiting it, which could be the home of our progenitors at some point in the past. Uh, evidence of, uh, of a global civilization is all around us. Greece, Egypt, you know, India, Assyria, China, it's everywhere. Sphinxes are everywhere. You can find sphinxes. You can find pyramids on every continent. We have um, Mexico, Egypt, and Cambodia pyramidal structures that are almost identical. We have them on the same, almost the same, um, you know, longitude line. So we basically have these megalithic structures built all around the globe on, on these earth energy lines 
and we have pyramids everywhere, which means we have one architect. We have an architect that has gone around the planet, most likely several architects that have learned from the same source, this knowledge, and put their own little spin on the civilizations around the planet. Again, proving that we have been engaged by a species with, or people with a, with a higher level of knowledge than us, and that imparted it to us. And then we did a lot of the work, but we were taught, this, we were taught how to do the work. A master architect doesn't go build a building. He draws the plans out, and then the workers go put it together. These are the Earth's energy grid lines. On every single one of these cross points, you can find an anomaly on this planet. So globally, we have anomalies at every single point, including right off the edge of, right off the coast of Florida in the Bermuda Triangle, we have uh, found and discovered pyramids down there, still emitting some type of exotic energy. Now, if you take a hole right through the Earth, directly to the other side of the planet, from the Bermuda Triangle, you end up in the Devil's Triangle by Japan, right off the coast of Japan, or you have another famous, well-known, gigantic underwater pyramid there. Again, evidence that we have the same construction techniques being used by the same people all over the planet. If you like this video and you want to see more amazing content, go ahead and check out the next video on our channel.